Well, this theme of each shows is to make it right in, in Mansi Tapus Gawi. Um, and subtitled, Mistakes Are Made in the Past and How Can We Correct Them? And I know that over the history of Nira there has been, you know, I suppose a few mistakes made. Um, nothing serious, I think, but, uh, you know, I'm just here along the way. But I like this theme, like how can we, if mistakes are made, how can we now address them? And it's not always easy, sometimes you can make more mistakes as you're trying to solve them. And I think that's the, you know, kind of summing up the year, right? We're all trying to correct mistakes made in the past and then more discussions and conflict can happen. So um, that's part of my, all these themes. I'm going to just also make it a, a personal story. I want to start with where we are. Many see the island is uh, nine miles away, maybe eight miles away, and this is a map of Minisi Island just to the south, uh, very close. Um, and it's uh, you know for the it's a capital for the Munsi people, and the Munsi word some people say is derived from the word Minisi. And what does Minisi word mean? Sometimes translated into a stony island or stony place. That would be min, uh, minis, you know, and then uh, asin for stone and then in for place. But it also could be places of many berries or small berries because min is also berry. So I wondered to, uh, if anybody's ever been to Minis St. Island and found lots of berries, let me know. But I have been there, but I wasn't thinking then, looking for them. So um, <clears throat> my son is. Uh, uh, Ipujij in his Mi'kmaq name, but uh, which is legal equal, but his uh, mother is part of Mini Saint Munsi, and she lived for a long time right near the island, and as did her family for hundreds of years. And uh, so when I asked him, uh, you know, about what he says to his friends about his identity, he says, "I don't know the exact number of my blood quantum, but I have spent 100 percent of my life knowing I was part native." and experiencing that way of life. So I think that's a good answer is for him because, you know, he started him young. And uh, so we're going to talk about what young people learn. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I liked it. Some of the earlier talks yesterday were talking about, you know, kind of kind of revising our whole view of history. There's so many mistakes that are made in history. And one of the things that the children are often in the, in the 26 counties in New York State that are actually mainly Algonquin, uh, territories, the children are told that they're Iroquois. And um, this is, you know, a little startling, but uh, they've been doing this consistently. It seems to uh, have started with Arthur Parker in 1900. I'll get around to that later. But uh, then the parents start to try to help the kids, and they find they're falling down this rabbit hole where none of the books agree with what they're being taught in school. So they look, okay, Iroquois. And then they find out they're not really Iroquois, they're called Honosone, or Honosone, right? And so that's the first warning that something is a little odd. And then they keep digging, and then the first thing that all the Iroquois have all gone, and then they find out there's plenty of Haudenosaunee still here and there as individuals, and also some on reservations and reserves further north. And so then they dig a little further, and they find actually those 26 counties were Algonquin and not Iroquois or Haudenosaunee. And then they find that all the Iroquois, the Algonquins all have been dead, and they're all left, and so don't worry about it. And then they find out that's not true either, and that there's plenty of Algonquins around. And then they find out that they hear this word, you know, Delaware. Well, it's really Algonquin is a great big umbrella, but Delaware was the tribe. But then they find out that this is an umbrella term, and there wasn't really one Delaware tribe. And then they find, well, they're all gone dead anyway. And then they find actually that's not true, and there are many still living around. And then they find out that they're not really Delaware, they're Lenape. And so then they thought, oh yeah, the Lenapes are out there, they're gone, so don't worry about it. And then they find, no, actually there's Lenape around, but actually our whole area here is Muncie. And you say, Muncie? I never heard of Muncie. Well, it's one of the largest tribes in North America. So then they said, oh, Muncie are all dead anyway, don't worry about it. And it turns out there's lots of Muncie individuals living around here and everywhere, and that we're in part of that territory. And then you find out that there's Esopus Muncie, and that there's Minisink Muncie, like my family, and then there's, you know, uh, Stockbridge Muncie, and then there's Stock, Stockbridge Muncie Band Mohicans, and then there's others like Rutherton, and there's lots of Muncie. So it's this huge part of American history that you, you know, never heard about, and their son was never son, you see. And so, 
So that's like, then you get to that level. And, and then you find out, well, there's these Wappingers who aren't really Muncie. And, you know, in New York City, they intermarried with the Muncie back and forth. So that makes it confusing. And then you find out, really, there's been Taino, whose uh, headquarters are in Puerto Rico, and they've been there for thousands of years, and their placings are there, and lots of the artifacts that you find are actually either Taino or influenced by Taino. And uh, William Ritchie would probably back you up on that. So then it gets so confusing, and, and there's place names like Canarzi is actually a Taino word for a watershed, and the of the watershed is really the East River, which isn't a river when you were alive in school, it's not a river. It's really, um, it's like a wet, it's a, it's a watershed, and that's what Canarzi means if referring to these rivers. So you think, oh, let's forget the whole thing, let's call it Iroquois. <laughs> so that's what, has anybody ever done this trip? When I'm talking about, yeah, yeah. Anybody who's had a kid in the New York, lower New York public school, this is what happens. So, so my kid safely mini sing. There was no question. And, and, and. So I'm going to take you on a couple of little journeys here uh, with this whole idea of correcting mistakes made in the past. So just to follow where this leaves, where this island here led to my, you know, like son help shape his way of thinking. He spent part of his life as an organic farmer in a remote area of Hawaii, where there's no pollution, which is really great. That was one of his goals, one of his goals to make things right by harvesting healthy food where there's no pollution. And his farm was at the foot of Mount Kilauea, does that name ring a bell? This is the southeast corner of Big Island. Just before the volcano erupted, being a good Minisink Munsee, he said, wait a minute, I feel funny, I have an intuitive sense I should go back to the U.S. And he did immediately, went back to the U.S., uh, and then, when his fellow farmers were displaced, shall we say, by lava flows, major lava flows, and their cars were gone and everything, they came back to the U.S., and they came to him, and they asked him for help, for food and shelter, and he gave it to them, and uh, helped them get on their way in their new lives. And there's many amazing stories, if you ask anybody who's been in Hawaii during Kilauea, I've heard some people were on top when it went, and they managed to survive. Seriously. But it was the right thing to do, so that's the idea. It's like when mistakes are made, you know, you try to correct them and you try not to make more mistakes. So, in the book, Native American Stories of the Sacred, I, I tell the mud diver story, which is about the creation of the island out of a turtle. Some people say it's Staten Island, but it also could well be this mini St. Island, which is about uh, eight miles away. And uh, the animals, the duck, muskrat, turtle, and bullfrog, cannot find dry ground and are unhappy, so they have a meeting, like this meeting, to make it right, quote unquote, make it right. So that's the story. So I felt it would be a mistake to tell the story in English, uh, which was first told in Muncie, as we know, the Muncie story of this version, and that's, of course, an Algonquin language spoken in Matamoras, but also southern New York, northern New Jersey, and some other places. So instead of setting it just in English, I translated it back into the Muncie based on the vocabularies I had learned from uh, Beulah Timothy, who was a Muncie tribal language teacher in, in Canada. Um, it was the first time the Muncie version had been published in, in, in Muncie. Again, it seemed to be a way of correcting mistakes made in the past because we know that in residential schools, Muncie and other Algonquin speaking children were tortured. Um, I have this on first hand accounts of um, even federally recognized tribes who tried to speak their own native language in school and say they were beaten and tortured beyond ways I can't talk about here. So, this uh, continued into the 1980s, by the way, especially in Canada, not just the US. And so, by putting it back in Muncie, it was like, yeah, you didn't win. We won. So the phrase, to make it right, in Muncie is tupus to and that became a favorite expression. And I told this story is going to go somewhere. Uh, my introductory phrase book to Micmac and my introductory phrase to Muncie have been used by uh, indigenous school children in Canada, especially for decades, on many reserves, published by the tribal councils, and photocopied over and over until they faded out of uh, visibility and they became illegible. But they kept photocopying them and you know, publishing them as they wished. So, of course, these are not written languages, and we know that, but thousands of kids, native kids, felt it, it helped them to have 
uh, to overcome the various stigmas attached to speaking a, a oral tradition language because these, their grandparents were called illiterate, which is a very, talk about an insult, a lunar insult. You call <laughs> illiterate when you're speaking fluently a language that's, you know, at least a thousand years old in this case. So, um, you know, that's just uh, one, my, one way that I felt I could help make things right in an indirect, subtle way that everybody wins. Because I don't like to see um, free will being undermined. You know, it's like an American thing, but it's also a Native American thing, like we have free will. And so if you're going to correct a mistake, you know, don't, don't create more mistakes where people lose their rights. So then, Arm of the Sea Theater, in 2002, Arm of the Sea Theater, under the direction of Patrick Wadden, performed this Asopa Suite for the first time, including in it a full dramatization of the Diver story with my uh, Muncie English narrative. I recorded the voiceover in English and Muncie, and it was performed many times. And in 2022, on the 10th, was that the 20th anniversary, um, on the banks of the Sofus River, we did it again only live, and I performed it live into the PA system, and that was really exciting. So the Muncie had fully come back to life, in, at least in the theater of Arm of the Sea, talking about that creation story to make it right. Now look, in this, this is a, a press photo. You see the frog with the purple arrow? That frog's going to turn out to be important. And then the play, the frog says, you know, to make it right, let's meet to make it right. Tapu Scaliente. And the young puppeteer who played the role of the frog was a very young man, very curious about all kinds forms of government. And he asked me all these questions all the time. I couldn't believe how many questions he asked, but I knew the answers. Several occasions, especially about the process for were changing unjust decisions. He was very concerned about injustice. These are the things in our modern world he didn't think were fair, but he didn't tell me what they were. So like his character, the frog, he wanted to make things right. So later, that young guy became mayor of New Paltz, not even 26, and led a national campaign for the legal recognition of gay marriage. And that young, young guy was Jason West, and he made the corner of the cover of Newsweek in a very short time, and that's him, you know, as a puppet. And this is the bullfrog who tried to make things right. And this I saw firsthand, all this happening, I didn't expect any of it, I didn't see it coming. Within two years of his final bow as frog, the met, in the mud driver story, Jason West was mayor of New Pops, and in 2004, at the age of 27, he solemnized 25 gay marriages in a single day, and faced immediate legal consequences, as of course the licenses were illegal generated a great deal of press, and Newsweek, and, and parades and everything, and after seven more years, the laws were changed in New York State. In 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, as it did, as other, 31 other countries did. Now we have 13 states who are, have restrictions, but anyway, just so you know, there had been uh, legalized gay marriage in San Francisco at that time, and he was inspired. Now, I mean, yeah, keep that in mind, this is my great-grandfather, William, and uh, his Micmac, and he was, uh, my maternal great-grandfather was, he said, it was said that his hair was darker than a raven's wing, which would give you an idea of the ethnicity that he leaned to. Um, he was openly speaking to his children, to his children about his Mi'kmaq or Micmac heritage, and became an honorary chief among the Passamaquoddy as he moved to the U.S. But they thanked him for his efforts because he built lots of houses for them in the winter to present them to the winner, and uh, they were very happy about that. Though born in the Miramichi Valley of New Brunswick, Canada, which is the next one over from Nova Scotia, he moved to, I know that's insulting, I'm sorry, he moved to southern Maine, and it was there that groups of Passamaquoddy would visit him in a long journey before cars, at least at summer solstice, and this made headlines in the local papers in southern Maine. Now his daughter Helen was an honorary member of the Passamaquoddy and gave workshops in bird lore in the 1920s, even to the chiefs, she sat and talked to the chiefs about, she was very ballsy, I knew her well. She would like tell the chiefs, well, this is how the birds do this. Now, in my journey, early in my journey in life, I had an amazing dream in which this great grandfather and his wife came to me, and he wore a Native American necklace with a sun pendant, and he stood in my face and he said, mistakes were made in the past. We must try to correct them. And it was, in other words, it was for me to make him right, because he was already in this spirit world. 
That was, that was one of the most vivid dreams I ever had. It changed my life, and I felt that it was an inspiration for me to correct stereotypes about Native Americans. So that was my first input to, to write and speak to help correct stereotypes, which were sometimes degrading or limiting or incorrect. It also led to my taking a role as a historian, reconstructing lost histories and geographies of do dozens of indigenous groups. And in the 1980s, I began to offer land acknowledgments at gatherings because this was the traditional call for uh, any proper ceremony. You always do an acknowledgment. So now that's very popular, right? But um, let's jump over a bit. Um, William, my great grandfather, was a 33rd degree Knights Templar, Knights Templar, not just Mission, and said that the Knights Templar came to Nova Scotia in the 1300s and earlier and worked with Mi'kmaq people to hide some of their Masonic treasures. And they also initiated the Mi'kmaq into, in the process of, as payment, because the money didn't mean much, so they had to do something, they initiated them. And many of Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia are members today. And I never became a member myself, but I grew up hearing all these stories and mentioning them, you know, in my work in order for time. And when the, um, if the Prometheus Entertainment asked me, it's actually Maria Oz, which was from a previous group, the uh, community, um, you know, films from Minnesota, and we did something called the Holy Grail in America. And they interviewed me a lot and they said, okay, is it really true? Are we like marking up country? I said, oh, you're keep digging and start digging because you're going to find lots of stuff that my grandpa sets up. So anyway, I recommend them to do it. So that became Curse of Oak Island and I did several interviews with them, you can see them on TV, um, and over the last few seasons. In the early 1900s, great grandfather William uh, re, um, and his son Clinton found many people uh, who were close-minded about this idea that the Templars and the Mi'kmaqs had long worked together. So as part of our oral tradition, we had no proof, and they said we were crazy, and they mocked us. And so I think that made it mad. So it was like, yeah, we've got to prove this. And that's our story. So in the last nine years, the Laguna brothers have dug up hundreds of ancient European artifacts from deep under the Nova Scotian soil. So it was, some, to me, proof that uh, sometimes 100 feet in the ground as to this uh, history, and some of them are from the 5th century. I feel that great-grandfather would be happy to know that his, his oral tradition has turned out to be proven. Now this flag, by the way, just to bring this up to date, um, I know that lots of Mi'kmaq people watch Oak Island and say, yeah, that's part of our story. They understand the significance. And the morning after my segment about the flag, the similarity between the Mi'kmaq ceremonial flag, which you see, and the Templar flag, and it was aired. And then the very next morning, all those flags were on every lawn up and down the streets of the reservations, especially Red Bank, which I had a witness testify to, was that immediately they all had the flags and they all put them up the next morning to show that they watched Oak Island. So in terms of land acknowledgement, it's another interesting story. And I'm getting to the Woodstock part in a minute. My interest in these acknowledgements led me to write in Native New Yorkers also to help correct the problem with the schools. I became um, part of the school board from New York State and I had the book and I said, let's put this in the schools and they said, no we're not. You know? And they gave that copy to some people in Buffalo or Iroquois and they loved it, but it's 300 miles away. Um, I found the records of these uh, habits in um, Hudson Valley were in disarray with countless contradictions, illogical interpretations, and outright lies. And while shut in for months with Lyme disease, I took the time to write this to untangle some of the mess, mostly for my son's education. I knew we wouldn't get it in public school. I wanted to make things right for him. And it became a 1,000 page book. And then I asked my publisher if he was interested in a book called Native New Yorkers. He said, Oh, yeah, I'd love to publish any book called Native New Yorkers. I like the title. And then he read it. He said, Well, great book, but you have to cut out 500 pages to put it in the paperback. I said, how do you do that? I said, just cut out every other word. The editors can think this way. But anyway, it turned out pretty well, so I edited myself. And then the, the hardback book was on the presses when the Twin Towers came down. And so then it became a project of rewriting, kind of reinterpreting American history in general. So this is the cover of the book. There's a funny story about this, about it, you never know how you're going to make things right. 
I uh, learned that hundreds of Mayan immigrants working in New York City on the streets and the factories and underground where they are had been using Native New Yorkers for land acknowledgments for their ceremonies. Somebody taken a copy out of the New York Public Library, made a copy, and then translated it into Mayan so they could do proper acknowledgments before doing ceremony. Of course, I don't get a dime for that because it goes back to the library, you know. But it's cool, it's really important to me to know this. Uh, this has been going on for years, and legend had grown up about me. They agreed that the figure on the cover must be me. <laughs> you see the resemblance here? Not. Uh, though um, they thought that was me, a gigantic Tata or elder, you know, towering 200 stories over New York City and giving them this information. So they tracked me down, and boy, were they disappointed. <laughs> I was, so it's not 200 stories tall, and I did not speak Maya. But as a result of translating the book, they were able to perform ceremonies properly, blessing the land of Manhattan for all of us. And so I think that's a win-win. And that's, sometimes you can make a difference without knowing what you're doing. So, and then talking about Pharaoh, we talked about, um, you know, the chiefs of the Montauk all being called, you know, Pharaoh is a name, and what does that mean? Well, um, this man is actually Stephen Tockhaus. Uh, well, the man on the left on the cover is Stephen Takao's Pharaoh, who lived during the Civil War and occasionally made parties in Midtown Manhattan with the socialites, which he thought was fun, and from time to time. He was a close relative of Chief uh, David Pharaoh, famous, famous chief. There's also a Talk House bar in East Hampton, which has his picture in it. When the book first came out, I met with Montauk Chief Robert Farrow, a direct descendant, he's on the right, and he's a um, descendant of Stephen and the chief. And I showed him the book. I didn't know how he'd react, but he bought four right away. And I had written the sad story of how they lost their land and their tribal identities from them in the name of progress because they wanted to put the Long Island Railroad right there. The state told them they are no longer a tribe. So I encouraged him not to give up, <clears throat> trying to get the land back. And last year, a bill was passed to reinstate them, but Kathy Cuoco vetoed it, I'm not sure why, which had proven to be unpopular that she did that, but now there's even a greater drive to pass this bill. So when I met Dave Mason of Traffic, a rock star, I offered him the book. I said, hey, I'll give it to you, and I'll sign it. He's out of my already read that. <laughs> and uh, so he knew all of it. He knew more about Stephen Takao's theory than Pharaoh than I ever did. It shows you that this man is quite a rock star in his own right. Now, this is uh, June 21st, 2017, when the Tappan Zee Bridge was, was being rebuilt. You know, there was a bill that, to change the name to uh, Andrew Cuomo Bridge, and there's been a lot of uproar about that. And so now you see, by the way, so now I wrote a 200-page book about the Tappan. This was the first book I've ever written on the subject, because I really felt an injustice was done. And they were benevolent leaders over a, a large territory, and they were Muncie, by the way. And uh, so they had dug out ferry canoe routes across the Hudson, many of them, ensuring safe travel and trade to the New York City area in the Hudson Valley. So this map on the left is from that book. It was, again, first book on the subject. On February 20th, 2023, State Governor James Scoofus of Woodbury launched a bill to re-rename the bridge to Tappan to help, you know, kids ask questions like, where's the Tappan? Well, that's good. And we can talk about the history and about that. So he said, it's the rightful name, you see. He too wanted to make it right. And, uh, you know, so there was part of the injustice is Governor Keith, who was the governor of the Dutch colony, ordered a massacre of the Tappan and other natives at Pavonia, February 25th, 1643. And um, to jump over some of that, but there were Tappan women and children in the Tappan near what would become Liberty Island. And this whole idea of changing it and remo removing the name Tappan from the bridge just brought up a lot of, you know, bad memories for a lot of people. And so they moved west. The Tappan during the massacre moved west into the Ramapo area. And uh, I'll talk about a land back story that is very successful. This just happened in Mawa, which means a place of gathering. You see the purple arrow pointing to Mawa, very near here, the capital village of the Ramapo. Lunape Nation, that means good people, is very next, uh, near the principal Ramapo site called Split Rock, the sacred site. They lost their rights to the land over 200 years ago 
Last month it was purchased by the Land Conservancy and then donated back to the Ramapo. And Split Rock Mountain features 66 different petroforms of many different kinds of alignments, including astronomical, hydrological, and site-to-site -site alignments. And David Johnson has done the photos. So if you want to know the details, you have to talk to David Johnson because it's still pretty much in the, under the protection of the Ramapo and they're not, you can really only go by their invitation right now. And there's the split rock on the right. And this is on the left, you see a photo I took of the split rock up close. There's, there's those offering stones stuck in between the portal. And here on the right, you see some of the alignments to the valleys below from the top of the mountain. There's these pointed stones everywhere, and there's you know, 66 of them, and all kinds of different things. There's one of the typical ones that's lining up. And again, you know, the landscapes, other mountains, other sites. And the one on the left is a really nice turtle that's up there. And uh, on the right is some also from Spruceton Valley that's a similar parent. And this is the buffalo effigy, which is very unusual. Human intervention, definitely. Glacier did not do that, uh, but several tons, 17 tons, I don't know. So I had the pleasure of examining this rock shelter with David Johnson. And it sometimes looks like a buffalo lying on its side, grazing in the grass. This is all on this new site that's now Ramapo. So I want to talk about, and, and you can, do you have it? Are you watching the time? Uh, yeah, you've got about 10 minutes. Left. Okay. <laughs> Um, there's a lot more to go. So, um, I was, uh, again, in terms of Algonquin, so, you know, this isn't exactly one of our words, but on the left you see a map of the Tinted Territory, the Algonquin Territory. On the right you see the migratory area of the uh, white-tailed deer, the word is Atuk, and so we called ourselves Kichi Atuk and the people who wear the skin of the white-tailed deer, and you see we have the same, um, you know, same territory. And uh, so it was during that time I was working with William Commanda, and he said I was the tribal historian. And so I said, well, let's reinstate this long last name, Kichiatuk Woman. So I've been trying to, you know, slowly and very gradually kind of suggest that was a good term to use. But also, while I was in this position, I facilitated the creation of the TEK, or Traditional Ecological Knowledge Department of Parks Canada. And so there is now a division of Parks Canada called TEK, and they're getting a lot of press. They're finding all these things out. Like, for example, they suggest they want to reinstate even sweetgrass, and so they told natives to plant sweetgrass at this spot, and the natives said, well, we don't really want to. And then later on, they found out, so why don't you want to? Find you at, oh, well, because this isn't where we grow. It's not going to grow here. And so the sweetgrass was all dying. And so they said, where do you want to do it? They put it in a new place where the scientists didn't think it could possibly grow, and of course it's growing right. So anyway, so um, this is kind of give you an idea about Algonquins. And this is uh, also Charlene McRae, First Lady of New York City, wife of former Mayor de Blasio, suggested the Gracie Mansion website needed better acknowledgement of these contributions of New York City, which were not getting any credit. And so, also regarding the story of Horn Hornswoop, which is now where Gracie Mansion is. And Paul Gunther, who is now deceased, but, uh, he, we and I were discussing how to do this, and we created a critical narrative showing, you know, both sides of the story, good and bad, uh, on the website, and then I drew a series of history maps, some of which are on the table, that can base on that history. This is Canarsie Satchins around Hornswoop, and again, you see a purple arrow pointing to Hornswoop, where Gracie Mansion is, and it was in Retrowana's territory. Sherilyn and I did a major smudging of the property, which was a lot of fun. And we, we by intention, we smudged all New York City and uh, did a great ceremony to kick it off. And the, the acknowledgement and the smudging were long overdue. So I'm going to get to the last 10 minutes. I'm going to talk about the Woodstock um, thing. Because what happened was they asked me to go to WAM, went to Woodstock Arts Association Museum, and so we've got 20 landscape paintings that are 100 years old, and they're all by white folks. And, you know, there's all this beautiful land, but we don't know who the Native Americans were, and I would say Indians, you know. So we want you to, to, to write this wrong. There's this gap in our knowledge. We've got the nice looking paintings. We don't know what the history was for several thousand years. So um, I did that, and one of the things acknowledging Mama Nukwe here was the local female sachem of Yusopus Munsi. They had many female sachems. And so I started talking, lecturing about her, and this is her self-portrait. 
that she did in the 1600s, a lot of Monet influence. I can't explain it. <laughs> and this is, people started making statues based on her drawings, including that one, which is several of them now. And um, so this was the, uh, she had a peace speech, which was very significant, and kept New York out of the Philip King Philip's War, and they never entered, and have never been in war since. And she, there was a wrong being made with a yellow triangle was where the colonists were selling on Muncie land, was causing a lot of anger when actually they had, they had treated fairly for the tan area, and she fixed it by, <laughs> by saying, just pay us something, please, you can live there. Now this is the newspapers came out about this lecture I gave at this this association museum. So I'm, I know I'm short on time, but this painting was Ikhwaq Kwam's uh, portrait made in London. And the thing was everybody said he was Mohawk, but he wasn't Mohawk. He was Mohican living in Muncie territory. So we straightened that out. And this is one of the paintings, Bearsville Moon. And in the uh, captions, I'm going to go these real fast, but you know this talking about Bearsville Hollow, well, Bearsville, you know, the bears of the clan of the chiefs of the Mohicans, and it also talked about the, um, you know, bee tree area, which depicts, and it turns out the bee trees are hickory trees, the natives believe that they were best for making the beehives. And this is uh, Indian head, and so you can't really see it from this angle, but according to, I think, Glenn Clarisburg has found a spot where it looks like an Indian head. And did a lot of research, and it turns out there is this truth to this story about uh, about this Chief Shandaken, which you know, a big area is called Shandaken. And this is a portrait um, by Thomas Cole of Shandaken's daughter, who was murdered in the story. It turns out, you know, sometimes you have these native oral traditions that sound just phony and made up, and sometimes they're really true. But you really have to do the research. So this this phony story turns out to probably be rather true about his daughter being killed and he went through this long walk and ended up in Shandake and, and um, it means place of evergreens basically. And this is his journey as far as I can reconstruct. It's kind of like this big bow and arrow and that's circle areas where Indian Head is. So it's right in the middle of his territory. Now this is a uh, waterfall and uh, it was a fishing spot and uh, so you know there was a lot of uh, various stories in, in histories here that a lot of them were untrue and so I had, had to dig through very versions of this story and then throw out the ones that turned out not to be true and ending up was just basically a great fishing spot and when they put the mill there they all had to leave and uh, but there was an old route to Kingston that went by there, a native trail. This is Dean of Cornfield uh, by Alan McKnight and so I dug into this and of course there's uh, was really one of the main spots for hundreds of years. The natives would travel to Zena Cornfield along a certain trail and to, to harvest, to plant in the spring and harvest in, in the uh, off and autumn. And there was also seemed to be Iroquois and Algonquins working together on this. And, uh, you know, Rainbow Weaver met me there, Valerie Grant, descendant of Joseph Grant. She gave me the corn teachings. Anybody who wants to know, I'll tell you, but Indian corn has multicolored. Uh, kernels that are not in straight rows, but they all fit together in a flow. So it's not like rules with straight lines. And then in 1999, uh, many community members helped the newly reformed Woodstock Land Conservancy with a lot of money to purchase the land so that it wouldn't be turned into condos. So that's her. Yeah. This is uh, Zulma Sil Parker's uh, oil about what was going on at the Shokin Reservoir before it was put in. And through the, uh, a great run that many people have written about is the destruction of this whole area of the Valley of Sopus was turned into reservoir. And there's songs about it and stories and films. But the thing is that the Davis family, uh, who, you know, always said, well, our ancestors were living down there and now we're underwater. And it turned out it was true. There were 19 properties belonging to Davis families that were inundated by this one reservoir, 19. And there's still Davis properties on the edge. But uh, I looked at some of the photos of them, and they look like the people telling me they were Davises. So the story tends to ring true. So this is like an idea of what might have it looked like down there. And uh, by the way, this is Bishop Falls. And uh, I don't want to go all the stories, but we say that every waterfall has a song. 
Abernathy and Mohican say that, but it was just interesting, Enrico Caruso visited, and also it turns out that the Wurlitzer is designed kind of like that falls, and there's a whole story about that may have actually happened, inspired indirectly by the falls. And there's Bridal Falls, and this is another Woodstock farm here. Now, this is one I especially wanted to feature today, because um, this book is right over there at the edge of the table, and the landscape depicts uh, Tyson Tianic Mountain on the left and Slide Mountain on the right. In the back is part of Panther Mountain. Surrounding Panther Mountain are Friday Mountain, Slide, and Never Sing Mountains. And Panther Mountain is a source of Woodland Valley Creek as well, which joins the Ahsoka. So all these rivers come out of this one mountain. Panther Mountain is a source of the Panther Gill, surprisingly enough. Now, Panther Mountain has long been regarded as a sacred spot and the big Indian powwows gatherings that were held each year over two decades, less than a mile from the foot of the mountain, and were spiritually inspirational with Mary Lou Stapleton uh, working with them was mixed native heritage going back a very long way. Now, Zena Halpern, a name many of you know, author of the provocative book, The Templar Mission, which is over there, and mentions Panther Mountain. She says, and I think accurately, the uh, Lenape people, place of the place of the wellspring of creation, that's her name for it, uh, and this was pointed out to me by a Muncie living near here named Robin Hill Chandler, She's part of the DAR, by the way, and she's Muncie. And this epithet combines their knowledge of the various rivers that were wellsprings of origins, either on or near Panther Mountain, whose rivers are considered wellsprings of creation too. Plus the knowledge of their ancientness of the mountain and the biblical cataclysm that, that uh, formed it millions of years ago. So this is the important story. Panther Mountain, the 18th tallest of the Cascals, was uh, shaped 375 million years ago by a meteor a half a mile across that dashed into the earth and created a hole uh, 2670 feet deep. The Esopus Creek and the Woodland Valley Creek filled the edges of the hole and created a near perfect circle of water <coughs> around the mountain, making it almost island like. The circle is a widely understood symbol among Native Americans for sacredness, for the wholeness of life, either in omens or in petroglyphs by the way, and then you've seen that we saw one yesterday, circles, and possibly even creation as a whole, adding to the perception of sacredness in the eyes of all who look upon this massive peak, or those who plant their moccasins on, on giant ledge, which is nearby. Now, this is, okay, here's the this picture. It is not well known outside Native American circles that panther is the name of a meteor or comet, and the name of the spirit of war that sent it and this is according to Obama cosmology, and apparently the Muncie attributed sacred life-giving properties to the war panther that have been kept secret to this day. And I know there was last night a petroglyph with a long panther tail, right? Well, the war panther's name is Maminda Asi. And like the catamount that climbs on the signs of the Emerson Resort two miles from Panther Mountain, the comet has a long, pale, golden tail as well. You think about it racing across the horizon. When he attacks, we are to imagine that tail streaming out straight behind him. In fact, when he charges across the horizon in his golden tail that we mainly see as he drops little meteorites from the sky, we have to clean them up. And so, some say that we may, that, that uh, war might arise in the direction from which uh, Maman Daasi comes. When the war chief Tecumseh was born, Comet passed over his village. This is certainly a kind of a key game really woven, which is a prophetic sign, a magical sign. And that is why he was named Tecumseh, which was Shawnee in his own language, for a panther passing across. Shawnee people are closely related to Muncie, but their words are sometimes different. It was interpreted by his elders that the comet came from the south, and so he would never be defeated in battle as long as he was in the south. His only defeat came in 1814, and it was in the Tenth River Valley in the north, and that his final battle, by the way, and like Panther Mountain, the Thames was in Muncie territory at the time. Naturally, it uh, stands to reason the Panther Kill is looked upon with reverence, and that the uh, source of the creek high in Panther Mountain is even more sacred than other headwaters. In fact, 
the Ahsoka's River itself comes from that earth in that circle. So that's some, a local lore that relates to us. Now here's the panthers I mentioned. You see their long tails? That's not accidental. Those are the comet tails of gold. And you see the circle of life around the base of Panther Mountain. So it's very sacred. It's also now, you know, the homeland of Menla and Zen Mountain Monastery and all these sacred uh, spots from people all over the world who come here and they just know that this has got to be sacred. But very few people know that the comet is panther. And that's to come to make that famous. And there's all these, like I say, all these sacred gatherings all the time around it. And uh, I just want to say we've talked about, I know I've got one minute left, right? Um, people have talked about Manitou stones. And we have Overlook Mountain, which is kind of uh, in the shape of a Manitou. I'm going to show you an Ezra Stiles, who founded Yale University, was the first one to really catalog and name these various Algonquin sacred stone shapes as having literal meaning. So there was a shape, he said, was the Manitou. And this is the stone, from my understanding on the left, uh, one that he identified as a Manitou. It's a little more pointed than, than some others we see today. But that's him in the middle. And on the right, you see the, the graveyard at Kingston Old Dutch Church. And all the gravestones have Manitou shapes. Um, so there you see more of them. And then you see in the background, upper left, that's the, that's the north end of Overlook Mountain, and the, actually the beginning of the Wall of Manitou, which apparently may have been named because of that feature. You see a better picture maybe even on the right, because as you're driving into Woodstock, you see that, that curved knobby point, that's the Manitou shape. And there's, that's not vegan, but you see a similar shape. So uh, there's it from a distance. So our, we're kind of done, right? Well, yeah, we're on the top. Oh, okay, well, exactly what I want. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me share all this with you.